Last Sunday in the book of Jude, and I would remind you, and especially for those that weren't here last Sunday, Jude is the next to the last book in the New Testament, just before the book of Revelation. And it is one of the shortest letters in the New Testament. And Jude identifies himself first and foremost as a, as a slave, uh, not in the sense that he was owned by another man apart from being owned and pledging his faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't presume upon his heritage of being a half-brother to the person of Jesus, but he does identify himself as a brother to James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And we spent a few minutes together on verses 1 and 2, and we take up this morning verses 3 and 4, and we're going to wrestle with the words in there. There are words in there that uh, have meaning, and we need to understand what the message is. So, in the Bible that I'm reading from, it's the, uh, it says, dear friends. I, I like the Bible that says, dear brothers, the idea of, of family, because you can be friends with people. Do you have friends that aren't family? <laughs> Do you have family that aren't friends? You don't have to answer that, but uh, if, if you would be honest, you probably have family that aren't friends. But there's a difference between being a friend and being a brother. Although I was eager to write you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For certain men who were designated for this judgment long ago, have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of God into promiscuity and denying our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Word of God. May He bless the reading and the hearing and the application of His Word. So first of all, let's wrestle with this idea of contend. What does it mean to contend? If we were to uh, bring a rope in here and we would divide up and we were to play uh, tug of war, tug of war. Is that truly a war? I chose to entitle today's message a declaration of war. Is that truly a war? Well, I would hope not. You know, we would put a line between us and we would pull and give and pull and eventually one side would prevail. Either that or we would all surrender and say, let's go get something to eat. Okay? Well, let's go back all the way to the beginning where God created Adam out of the dirt. And he decided that it would not be good for Adam to be alone. So he gave Adam Eve out of man Came Eve. And you could go back and reread that conversation between a husband and a wife, and they decided that it was okay to do the very thing that God said they shouldn't do, and they ate. They ate of the fruit. In a sense, they declared war on God. They said, you know what? You are God. We don't deny that you're God. But what we have decided is we are going to be our own selves. We are going to be contentious. We are going to be contentious. As a result, you and I suffer in the heartbreak of Adam and Eve being our ancestors, and the Bible speaks to that as Adamic, A-D-A-M-I-C, Adamic sin. All of us have that sin nature. All of us, every one of you, every one of you, each of us. It doesn't matter where you're from, who your ancestors were. We're traceable back to Adamic sin. Having told you that... You might say, well, if it hadn't been for great, 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 however many greats it would be, uh, I wouldn't have these problems. No, the Bible goes on to say it is out of your nature that you yourselves have declared war on heaven. You have said at times, Jesus may be Lord, but I'm not going to follow his way, his teaching, his principles, and his precepts. Would you agree to that? Do you ever feel that sense of the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin? Sin is a declaration of war on the rules and the rightness of heaven. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have declared war against heaven. But Christ is the peacemaker. He is common to them that believe he is master, Lord, and Savior. He has made peace, and he has brought us to that point of being reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus so that we are no longer 
on the wrong side. Now, that's an introduction of sorts. Poor Jude. And I like what Judy did with the worship folder. I thought about saying something like this, and I didn't ask her to, but did you see on the worship folder it says, Hey, Jude. Uh, some of you are not young enough, or are too young to know uh, the background for that song, but that used to be one of my favorite songs, and all I know is the title of it. I like the, I like the music. Uh, for whatever that is, that's a confession. It, it, you know, it was my generation. It was my culture. And it came at a time when our world, our world was caught up in a conflict in another part of the world. And it seemed like our politicians in that day and time, my perception, seemed like our politicians at that day or time couldn't figure out if we were in a war or we were not in a war. We had troops dying in Vietnam, and yet our politicians chose to not completely go in and win the war. Did we win the Vietnam War, or did we somehow negotiate our way out of there? Well, you see, when I looked at that and I, I lived through that experience, I was somewhat dismayed because uh, friends of mine came home from the war. Some of you were there, and some of you would say, we didn't win the war. What, what did we gain over there? Because Vietnam is not a democracy. There are more people have been killed as a result of that war. And it doesn't seem like ever since then that we in America have understood how to fight and how to win. And you have to wrestle with this now because, go back with me all the way over here into the Old Testament, and you have the story, for example, of Abram, Abraham and Lot gets captured and uh, Abram raises an army of 300 and they go out and they fight and they deliver Lot and his family back. So I'm not here. We're not going to talk about the concept of what I've learned to call just war. Just being right. There is a right time to raise an army. There is a right time to fight for someone else. What we're going to talk about is what the Bible talks about is your contending for the faith. And I'll offer you two phrases, and I'll get back to them in a moment. One is, I think it's time for you to stand up. Now, I don't mean physically stand up, but I think it's for you to stand up for the faith. I really do. As I, as I, in fact, one of the, the good people of this church came to me one week and suggested that some of the comments I had made from this pulpit or podium or holy desk or whatever you call it, and they appealed to me to not politicize the pulpit. Okay, so if I don't do that, what happens when the politicians politicize the pulpit? Did you know that this week our governor signed a law that makes it criminal for counselors to do what is called conversion therapy? It is against the law. If one of your grandchildren were brought to me and they are struggling with their sexual identity, it is now a criminal offense if I use what is called conversion therapy and try and get them to agree with their natural body that God chose to make them. It is now a criminal offense. Did you know that? Yeah. That's what's going on in your world today. Now, does that sound like I'm politicizing the pulpit? I hope so. We have to stand up. We are being told to be silent. We are being told not merely to be silent, but they're going to tell us how to live our faith. Jude says, I wanted to tell you something different. And every Sunday, I'd love to come and tell you it's good news. It's good news. But my friends, there is bad news coming into your Christian experience. And I, like Jude, want to warn you how to deal with that. But before we worry about what's going on in Salem... Because that's already law. The, the governor signed that this week. Before we worry about what's going on in Salem, Jude is taking us to be careful that we know how to stand up and contend for faith in church. Again, I like some other translations in the Holman because it says uh, that, that people came in stealthily. Have you ever watched people in church? I like to watch people in church get up and move. Like if you had to get up and move right now. You know what we do? I don't know. Where, you, where did you read that if I bend over, I am less noticeable, I am less obtrusive to the service, and you can't see me because I'm bending over. I'm suddenly invisible to you. Well, that's the image that I have in Jude when he said some kind of people, the wrong kind of people, have crept into the church. I want to tell you something as I stand back up. 
that is true of then and it is true of now. So do what I would do. Look around, see who crept in. Who's here? Who's here? Who's here? Well, let's look to this so that we learn how to contend for the faith, what it means to contend for the faith, and fight for people and not fight with people. Jude tells us that right here in the Scriptures. But another way to ask it, if you crept in, does, not, does that not make you creepy? And I, Yes. Okay. So are there creepy people in the church? Yes, the Bible tells us. In this church... I'm not so sure. In other churches, I could give you names and addresses. I have dealt with some of them. But let's look at this again. I was eager to write to you about our common salvation. Now, he's not saying that what Christ did on the cross is a common everyday occurrence. What he is saying is there is no distinction. It's not based on your ethnicity. Jesus didn't die for a certain race of people. He didn't just die for the Jews. He died for those of us that are not Jews. He didn't just die for those that are educated, or he didn't just die for those that are undereducated. He didn't die for the rich only. He didn't die for the poor only. It is common. There is no barrier between you and God except your faith in Christ. Once you have expressed faith in Christ, there is no barrier. It's not based on gender. It's not based on economy. It's not based on geography. We experience I just love this. Jude is saying, you know, uh, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, Peter and Andrew the, the, uh, of the original 12, my salvation. I want you to just embrace that thought. Your experience with Christ, your forgiveness of sin, is not less than theirs. In fact, Jesus says that, you know, blessed are you that have seen me, but there is a blessing to come to those that who have never seen me. So a common salvation. But instead of being able to talk about that, I find it necessary to exhort you to contend for the faith. Now, do you know what it means to exhort? It's not a casual suggestion. It's not a whisper. It's to call you. It is to shout at you. There's a, there's a warning here to shout at you. Pay attention. There is, a, there, there, is, there is a conflict in the body of Christ. I'm telling you that. And it is time not that I speak up only, but that you stand up and you speak up about your own faith. Some people have what I call emergency faith. It's like, you know, in your car you've got flares and a flashlight and a phone emergency faith in case you break down just in case you break down you have that emergency faith that uh, in fact just a few moments ago there was someone that uh, was looking for me found me in my office and uh, it's, it's been years since they were active here they used to be very active here and I, they said to me it's time for me to reconnect where have they been why have they been looking at faith as only in case of an emergency do I need God and God's people. What, what Jude here is talking about is not emergency faith, but experiential faith. A, a, a faith that calls for you to be able to say to other believers, this today is my experience in Christ Jesus. Do you know why God gave the children of Israel manna and told them they needed to gather it every day? So they wouldn't live on day-old bread. He wanted them to have experiential faith. And that has not changed. God hasn't given us a different way to be saved. I was out in the shop the other day, and I don't like cobwebs. They don't bother me. I'm not afraid of spiders. I really didn't like cobwebs when, like Cecil Thompson, still doing telephone work. If I had to go under a house or in the attic, I never liked that feeling of cobwebs on me. But it didn't cause me, you know, to have an emotional... Re- I just... I, I, but, but I have a, a cobweb in a window, and just about the time I was going to clean it out, I saw a fly, and he went right into the cobweb. I said, yes, because... Worse than cobwebs, I don't like flies. Do you know why I don't like flies? Because they crawl around on garbage and other stuff that animals leave behind. And then I don't want them crawling on me. And that fly was there, and he was, you know, just wiggling and carrying on, and he was contending. 
He wanted to be free, but he was trapped in a web, not of his own making, but there it was. And the most amazing thing happened. This big, ugly black spider, I didn't see the spider, but all of a sudden, there he was. He felt the dynamics, the vibration, and all of a sudden, this spider, he, he just came out of nowhere. And do you know what he did? He jumped on that fly. I've never seen, I mean, he just grabbed him and drug him off in a corner. And I stood out there and said, go spider. You know, I don't like flies. And as soon as I thought about that, I thought, no, I don't like spiders either in my shop. And so I got a stick. And the fly what wasn't quite dead and the spider that wasn't planning on dying died. Yeah, because I was contending. I was saying, that's enough of that. And then after that, after this rain, I... I I found a worm out on, you know, I don't know why a worm had gotten out of the soil and was making his way across the parking lot. But he was too far gone to rescue him. I mean, I, I do. I'm gentle sometimes. I'll pick up worms and relocate them into my garden particularly. But I looked at this worm, and he was, he was just wriggling. I don't know why they spelled it like that, but W-R-I-G-G-L-I-N-G, wriggling. He was just in the throes of agony because he was just surrounded and covered with ants. Oh, you know what? That's nature. So do you like worms better than ants? Is that what you're telling me? Would you, would you welcome ants into your house? No, you don't want ants in your house no more than you want worms in your house. So what do you do? Or spiders or flies. So what do you do? You contend, don't you, ladies? Don't you, ladies? You have a, a swifter, don't you? You know, I mean, that's just a high-tech dust rag. You know? And somebody, somebody at uh, Josh and Felicia's wedding, it was a wonderful wedding, and there, it was Josh's mother was reciting some sort of a poem about Grandma's apron. And some of us are old enough to remember Grandma's apron, but, and, and I, she, didn't, she didn't do it in rhythm and rhyme, but she said that uh, Grandma's apron uh, wipes the nose of whomever grandchild it is. And uh, uh, having just gathered the eggs out of the hen house, if you've ever been in a hen house, you know what's in a hen house. Besides, it's amazing. Did you know that you go in a hen house and there's cartons of eggs in there and the eggs have all been washed and sorted and grated? That's the way a chicken does it? Yes. No, Grandma would gather those eggs, and, and then Grandma would go in the house, and if there was a fly, she'd chew a fly with her apron, and then she'd make biscuits or whatever and she'd wipe her hands on her apron and look how we turned out we're all healthy and now we worry about germs and dirt for these little kids no we contend for cleanliness but what Jude is talking about here is not an outward cleansing but an inward cleansing a new creation it says in in the Bible that when Christ becomes yours and you become his you are not you are a new creature and in spite of that fact, we sit instead of standing. We're silent instead of speaking about the faith that is ours. What are those people like? Well, let me just tell you a little about the wrong kind of people. And maybe you have, maybe you have known some of them. None of you are like this, I'm sure. But what Jude is describing here is that person that is self-reliant. And what I mean by that is... They're the person who says, well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a part of the church, but I don't have to come. Do you know any people like that? I mean, in America, 50% of the people on the Southern Baptist church rolls are not involved in a church. In fact, you can do the math if you want to. Go check our annual church profile against our average attendance, and we only average about 42% of the people in attendance regularly that, are, that, that call themselves members. So they're self-reliant. That's, that's just who they are. They're also self-obsessed. Self-obsessed. They, they think about themselves. They, they think about what they want. Not only do they think about what they want, they think about how they want what they want. So they're self-reliant. They're self-obsessed. Not only that, they're insincere. They're insincere. When, when they want Jesus, they, they want him at his time and his terms and they want the church for weddings and funerals and anniversaries and birthdays that's when they want the church but here's the most noteworthy thing about them so be careful now because you haven't identified with being insincere or that they grumble 
they grumble. I was around one of my grandchildren the other day, and sometimes my stomach growls, and it was loud. And it was not only loud, it was long. And it just grumbled, and gr- it was made a noise. And she looked at me, and she said, are you hungry? <laughs> you know, what, what do we do when somebody becomes the chief grumbler? Oftentimes, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But that isn't what Jude says to do. He, sa- he doesn't say, you know, coat them with cooking oil. He says, contend against them because they are contentious and they are quarrelsome. In fact, ladies, did you know, because what I've been talking about is men. Isn't that what Jude says? Certain men. Men are men. Even back in that day, men were men. There's a confusion today if a man's a man or is he a girl. But in that day and in this day, Jude is writing about certain men that have crept in to be teachers. But ladies, lest you escape Proverbs 25 and 24, it says, Better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. Did you know that? Okay, did you know that? I'm not going to preach that. I just asked, you know, just making sure that you ladies weren't sitting here thinking, you know, I've done this. Give it to them, preacher. Preach to them. Preach to them. Preach to them. He's not talking to me. Give it to the men. They need it. Well, they do. So Jude is saying that men have come into the church. I want you to find 1 Timothy. We want to expand on this just a little bit so that you can go home and say, I can look this back up and I can, I can make some sense out of what the pastor so inadequately tried to explain to me today. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, we're talking about now how to know what tools, how to prepare yourself, how to be a contender for the faith so that you're not fighting with people, you're fighting for people. And... 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, Now the Holy Spirit explicitly says, In the latter times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through hypocrisy. And of these, they are liars who conscience are seared. They forbid marriage, demand abstinence from food that God created, and that food is to be received with gratitude for those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing should be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. So that says a couple things to me. One is that all all good things come from God, and we ought to pray before we eat. So last week, last week I told you my wife had a jar of kimchi, didn't I? And it was bubbling and crawling up out of the jar, and some of you after church said... Just in the love of Jesus, preacher, you need to go home and have some kimchi. So we got home. There was another jar of kimchi fresh from the store. And you know what happened when that jar was opened? I saw it this time. It bubbled like a 7-Up. It not only bubbled like a 7-Up, it crept up. I'm not exaggerating. It started moving. The food in the canned jar started moving upward and outward. It percolated up over the lip of the jar, and it stood that high above the top of the jar when I quit watching. Do you think I wanted to eat any of that? I am a little smarter than that. Even though some of you suggested, Miss Ella... that my wife ought to feed me kimchi. (laughs) I know this, that when you can something, you generally heat it to a certain temperature, having sterilized the jar. And you put that food that you want to preserve in that clean jar, and you put a lid on it, and you either under pressure or in a cold canner, not under pressure, you heat it to a certain degree until that lid snaps. And what I know is that the, the fermenting that is going on to make kimchi, because what kimchi is, I love cabbage. In fact, I had coleslaw last night. I just don't want to eat rotten cabbage, okay? I just don't want to. Now, the Bible says it would be okay for me to eat it. Do I have to eat it to be in a right relationship with Jesus? Absolutely not. But back to canning. Canning stops 
the microbes from corrupting your food. Do you, you, do you agree? Okay. Somebody actually told me, somebody in this church believes that that kimchi was still edible, that the canning process didn't stop the corruption. That's bad theology. You eat it, I'm not going to. Okay, I have been to Mexico and resulted in the Montezuma's Revenge. I don't want corruption. That's what Jude is saying here, is we need to understand that you and I, you and I, not me alone in your behalf, have to have a doctrinal stance that you can defend. And it is only in who Christ is and what he did for you on the cross. And if you, don't, if you can't defend that, then my offering to you is spend more time with other believers who will teach you how to articulate or say who Christ is. Because if you go to the last part of uh, verse 5, what does Jude say? Well, let's just read it. Instead of trying to do it from memory, he said, well, I'm some, I moved my pages and confused myself. Hold on a second. I didn't put my marker where I wanted to. I'm going to tell you what it says. It refers to Jesus as Lord and Master. Lord and Master. One of those, in my understanding, is He is Lord. He is above. He is, he is all authority. He is holy. He is, he is Lord. And that is, is here. So that, that's this relationship. Master is how I, I relate to Him in this physical life. One is spiritual. The other is material. They're, they're not separated. He is Lord and Master. He is not Lord only. He is not Master only. He is Lord and Master. And I told you, I think, Jude calls him Jesus Christ. Christ in the Greek means anointed or chosen one of God. So we're making sure that it is that Jesus who is your Lord and your Master. And if somebody says, why do you do what you do? It is because Jesus, the answer would be, he is my Lord and my Master. Otherwise, your your motivation is you are self-obsessed if it is not that he is Lord and Master. So back to 1 Timothy for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now remember, Jude begins by saying he's a slave. He is a D-O-U-L-O-S. He is a doulos of Jesus. Well, uh, chapter 6 of 1 Timothy says, All who are under the yoke of slaves, are, are you a slave to Jesus Christ? Are you a bondservant to Jesus Christ? If not, why not? Does that make sense? If not, why not? must regard their own masters to be worthy of all respect so that God's name and his teaching will not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters should not be respectful to them because they are brothers, but should serve them better since those who benefit from their service are believers and dearly beloved. I take away from that ever so quickly that it doesn't matter what your relationship is to other people. You are a servant to Christ and therefore be loving. But I want you to see what it says in the verses that follow. This is Paul writing to young Timothy. He's establishing churches. He's a a church planter, and he says, Teach and encourage these things. Ray Nelson was our pastor in Delta Junction, Alaska, and I grew up in Nebraska, and we had a way of slaughtering a pig. He's from Oklahoma, and he had a different way of slaughtering a pig. Now, when I say slaughter... We both shot the pig. That's not the slaughter that I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking that old pig to pork chops. Okay? How do you get from something that rolls around in the mud and eats garbage to Sunday lunch? And I told Ray that what I was going to do, the way I did it as a child, was we would get a 55-gallon drum and we would put it on edge on some blocks, cinder blocks, and we would build a fire under there, and we'd stand around, and the old men would smoke and tell the boys stories that we shouldn't hear or repeat. And then when the water began to boil, they would shoot the hog, and then the man would grab that hog and immerse it into that boiling water for a while, not to cook it, but to get it to where you could remove the bristles from the exterior. Now, the only reason you want to save the hide of a pig is if you plan to eat it called crackling. You take that skin and you, you drop it in hot grease and you, do you ever go to the store and get pork rinds? 
That's what I'm talking about. I don't know whoever was the first one to say, well, pork chop is good. Let's try eating the skin. Okay, but somebody did. So anyway, then you pull that pig out of there, and it smells bad. And with a sharp object, you just scrape, and you scrape, and you scrape. And then you wind up taking all of that and throwing it away, where I'm from. We didn't, we didn't make cratlins or chitlins. Do you know what chitlins are? Okay, good. I'm not going to tell you right now. But Pastor Ray said, Brother Tim, in Oklahoma, we skinned a pig. And I've skinned deer. I've skinned buffalo. I've skinned moose. I've skinned elk. I've skinned rabbits. I've skin, uh, skinned marmots. I mean, I've skinned up fish. I've skinned all kinds of But I'd never skinned a pig. And he said, I'll show you. So he comes out and... We shoot the pig, and we hang it up, and it takes him 30 or 40 minutes, and he skins the pig. Well, I wanted to butcher both my pigs at the same time. I said, Pastor Ray, I'm, I'm kind of slow here. I, I'm not quite sure how you did that. Would you, would you do the second one? And so about halfway through the second pig, he turns around, and he looks at me, and he says, Right. <laughs> Teach is one thing. It is time that we who teach put the expectation back on you and we take our hands off and say, it is time for you, if you would, skin your own pig. We are going to encourage you. We're not going to abandon you. We're not going to leave you. It's like saying, I want to learn how to ride a bicycle, but I always want training wheels. There will come a time when you say, the training wheels are slowing me down. I can't contend for the faith. Somebody help me take the training wheels off and then coach me and encourage me so that I can contend for the faith. Verse 3, If anyone teaches other doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, with a teaching that promotes godliness... So Bible study teachers, I'm looking at you. I'm asking the question, not out of a a, a contentious spirit, but out of a questioning spirit as your pastor. Does your teaching, is it transformational? Does it promote a godliness so that the people that sit with you in Bible study leave inspired saying, I used to be like that, but Christ in me makes me a new creature. And then he goes on to say, a person that doesn't teach like that is conceited, understands nothing, has a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words. Now, what else does Paul tell Timothy? From these come envy and quarreling and slander and evil suspicions and a constant disagreement, ladies, you'll like this, among men whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain, but godliness is contentment. Let me ask you this question. We're almost done. But when you come to church, go to church. We have guests from out of town. When you come to church, go to church. Do you want to be like everybody else in the church? What are the terms for joining and being an active participant? participant in church. Well, the first thing we look for is attendance. Okay, attendance. You attend. Well, that makes you extraordinary. Do you realize that? That that makes you exceptional. And so what we look for is people that attend. And we say they're good church members. They attend. And then if they're if they're really and, and you know, I don't know who gives what, but evidently somebody in the church gives something because the offering plate well the uh the counting committee has something to count. So people attend and people give. That's a good thing, isn't it? Wouldn't you say that it's a good church if people are attending and people are giving and people are willing, whatever that means, willing to help, willing to help? Doesn't that sound like, don't you want to be just like those people? No. You want to be like Jesus. You see, what we have done, I think, in the church, if we have set the standard, well, let's just be as good as the pastor or be as good as the deacons or be as good as the choir, or or, or the Bible study faculty. Do do you hear what I'm saying? None of us are good enough. Now, we are to be godly and good examples, and you ought to uh, aspire to be like certain people, but I want you to hear this. If you're settling for attending and being willing and giving, where's the power? Where's the power? What power, preacher? The power to see lives transformed do you remember what happened to the manna when the Hebrews would go out and they'd say you know what 
I just know on Tuesdays, I don't feel like gathering manna. I don't know what it is about Tuesdays. So on Monday, I'm, I'm just going to gather a little extra. Do you remember what happened to the manna? What happened to the manna? The next day it was... Uh, one time we were cleaning in the church, and our preschool son came around the corner, and he was chewing something, and we knew that there weren't any snacks. And I said, go show us. And he took us and he showed us. And he found Sunday school teachers for children, Bible study teachers, are so creative. They can find all kinds of things to occupy a children's time. And there was a bowl in there full of milk bone, wishbone dog treats in the children's Sunday school class. And every way that I looked at, I couldn't make the connection between a dog biscuit and the blood of Jesus unless they were having the Lord's Supper and they were using dog biscuits instead of unleavened bread. And I looked and there was no leavening in the dog biscuits. They were flat. They, they didn't rise. We have offered a generation of milk bone dog biscuits. The reason I was concerned about what my son was doing, he was chewing and I wanted to see what he was eating. And when he showed us, he had not only eaten the milk bone dog biscuit. Do you know what a weevil is? They were weevily. Jude says to you and I, not back then, but even now, that kind of doctrine creeps into the church. And we offer a watered down, milk toast, limp wristed, not life changing gospel. We've got a president right now who's working with the Republicans to fast track a trade bill. And we don't know what's in it. Does that bother you? Bothers me. Did I say anything about his race? No. Did I say anything about him being a Democrat? No. Who's he working with? The Republicans? And they're keeping secrets from us? I set you up for this. You said, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Do you know what that means? That you will contend for America. You will contend for America. And then Ginger uh, did the best job she's ever done, as far as I'm concerned, singing special music. Thank you, Ginger. But it's not about the Statue of Liberty. It is the cross of Christ. And we see our grandchildren and our brothers and our sisters and our neighbors living like hell because they're on their way to hell. And why? Because the church has refused. The church has refused. The church is refusing to contend for the faith. That means to examine each other's life and walk and testimony. And not to exclude people, but to come along beside them. Not fight with them, but fight for them and say, I love you. Don't you understand? I've said this, but not here. I think that the Christian church and even this one is going to have to apologize to Jesus I really do and if that seems contentious it wasn't said in a contentious spirit I want you to contend for the faith and be aware of the doctrine of the blood of Jesus which delivers you from death into a new life. Let us pray. Father, American soldiers and sailors, even today, Lord, are laying down their very life so that we can say the Pledge of Allegiance. But there are those in America who would be contentious, Lord, and remove the name of God from our pledge. And if they prevail there, as they are prevailing even in the courts, calling sin, sin, is being criminalized. It is time we stop sitting around and wringing our hands, but we stand up and we speak out and let the world know that Jesus is our Master, our Lord, and He is the Christ. Forgive us, O Lord. 
for not honoring the true sacrifice not only of soldiers and sailors and airmen, but even the Jesus who died for us, that we might be set free from the bondage of sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.